But, of course, your your first sort of high-profile collaboration was on a podcast dedicated to American politics, which is why uh, you've kindly agreed to talk to me about the significance, I'll start with you, Emily, the significance of Trump's announcement yesterday and the possibility that he might have postponed it given the uh, unexpected disappointment of the midterms from his point of view. It was teleprompter Trump, wasn't it, Mm. Um, last night, (laughs) three o'clock this morning for some of us, and it was very on message And it was quite, I thought, subdued. If you compared what he sounded like when he was in Ohio backing one of his candidates, J.D. Vance, there was the energy and there was the, you know, the shout and the mass. And this time it had that sort of slightly tamazepan feel to Mm. it, I thought, like... He was going to do it because he had to. He was like one of those parents that's been told, you've got to follow through. If you said you'll do something, (laughs) you've got to follow through. Everyone around him was telling him not to do it. You know, they were saying it's like it's like launching off the the Heidenberg's just gone down. It's it's the worst possible time to do it. He knows that he was making up numbers about the people he'd supported and, Mm. and and whether they'd won or not. I mean, the the blunt truth is the swing races, the swing seat races where his candidates were standing did not perform well. And yet he had to come out and do that because he'd, he'd trailed it. You know, it's the worst thing ever when you've said you're going to do something and you're made to stand there and do it. But it didn't feel like his heart was quite there. Which speaks of the confidence he must have had, John, that the polls were right. So what happened? What went wrong? There's one theory I've heard I quite like is that they completely discount anybody under 30 because nobody under 30 would ever answer a call from an unknown number, which well, is probably not quite... 100% a, right. It's probably part of the problem, isn't well, it, or actually, part of the uh, issue? Do you know what? The pollsters are taking a bit of a victory lap and right. they're saying we did get it right. We were actually the ones who said there wasn't going to be this red Republican wave and they were going to sweep to control of the House and the Senate. I think what's happened is, as Emily said, that... If you look at certain states where there were races played out, where there was, a, say, a race for the governor and the governor wasn't a Trump supporting mm. person, they did pretty well. But where the Senate candidate, and it's the same electorate voting, was a Trump supporter, they did badly. That happened in Georgia. That happened in Wisconsin. And so it's really interesting that it, it, you can make the calculation that Trump did badly in that election, and Trump supporters... Now, his name may not have been on the ballot, sure. but Trump backed... Up, everybody knew. But everybody knew. And what's really interesting is that I think the reason why Trump has gone, as Emily said, I've said it, so I've got to do it, and I think that, you know, Trump doesn't want to look weak, but equally, I think, one, it means that he can raise a lot of money still. Two, he makes himself the centre of attention, Donald Trump's mm. favourite place in the whole world to be. But three, and consider this, there is a lot of legal jeopardy that Donald Trump is facing now, not just the normal kind of writs that are flying. This is the Department of Justice potentially, you know, taking him to court. I think an attorney general would be incredibly bold to decide to take action against someone who is running to be the next president. Uh, I'm going to take issue with that because there is absolutely no immunity provided for somebody who is standing for candidate. And I think it's really important to recognise that the American Constitution doesn't have any recognition of somebody who is a post-president. There's no office of post-president. There's no office of running for president. Yes, when it gets close to the election, when you're about a month out, three weeks out, then you might find people unwilling to step in. But I'm not sure it should or would enter a calculation. This is, this is our podcast where we just disagree with each other. I think that, I tell you what, I think that's wrong. I think that the, the idea that everyone is equal before the law is a great idea in principle. You would have to take into account the political calculation Mm. of launching a legal case against an ex-president and someone who is running to be president again. And I think the idea that the Department of Justice and the Attorney General are immune from what the consequences of that would be is for the birds. Because they have personal and even political ambitions of their own, which would be which would come into Look, play. Look, don't with forget, any when he was autonomous facing impeachment, decisions. Yes. right? The first time or the second time? Either time, <laughs> his own supporters were saying, this is not the place. Mm. There are courts of law that can settle this. This is not the place. You know, impeachment's a very political, you know, he called it a witch hunt. There are there are courts and there are criminal, um, you know, allegations. That he, this can all be settled outside. Now it is. You know, he's facing what four, five different legal suits, 
And actually, the idea that you could just say I'm running and everything gets dropped, I think is ridiculous. Okay. I mean, I think you couldn't, as the Attorney General, stand you, there and... You, sorry. you can return to this theme later on, on, <laughs> on the news agents. I want, I want to know from you, John, from your time in, in, in the States with the Beeb as, as the American editor, is, is there any way to tell post-lie who, who was going along with it for reasons of ambition and who actually believed it who actually I think you can discern that I think there are the true believers yeah. who decided that the, the election was stolen and they absolutely bought into everything that Donald Trump was saying and there were those who were, thought it was expedient and mm. that was not because they wanted to get on with Donald Trump it was because they were terrified of Donald Trump and they felt unless they bought into this ridiculous story that the election had been stolen Donald Trump would come and kill them. And more or less, he did. Yes. Anyone who stood up against Donald Trump found themselves being what they call primaried, i.e. they were challenged about whether they could sit in, stay in their seat, and invariably, they lost. And all those people who said Donald Trump lied, he lost the election, now find themselves either retiring and leaving politics or have been forced out. Interesting. But isn't it extraordinary, though, that we are talking about Trump no longer having that sort of, you know, magnetism to him? The straw that broke the camel's back wasn't that he actually tried to overturn yeah. an elected government. It wasn't that he, there was an assault and attempted coup on the Capitol. It was a political calculus whereby he didn't seem to be winning anymore. Think of all the acolytes. Yeah. Think of all the enablers around him. That's what this story is about. Well, it's uh, not even about Trump. It's about those who've put him in power. Uh, up to and including Rupert Murdoch, who, who of course didn't pull the rug from under Donald Trump after the attempted coup or after the, after the deaths on January the 6th or after any of that, but has now reportedly. How significant is that, Emily? Do, do, the, do you remember? I mean... I, OK, this sounds really nerdy, but I remember over the 2020 election, on that night, it was Fox News Arizona, that yeah. called Arizona for Biden, and Trump got really angry. And they, it was the first sort of hint that they were going to, you know, start to pull away and start being the sort of the news channel rather than the acolyte channel. Now... The New York Post, also owned by Rupert Murdoch, has shown a whole variety of front pages, including mm. that recent one about Humpty Dumpty, the Trump falling off the wall, and wasn't that a mess, and he never built the wall. But last night, they did stay on it longer. Fox News stayed on the Trump speech longer than anyone else. I don't think Murdoch has made up his mind. I think he'll, he'll wait to see if he's a winner. Which right? way the wind is blowing, and if he looks winningy mm. enough, then there could be another change underway. John Sopel, Emily Maitlis, thank you so much. The news agents. What time does it drop, roughly? For people? Well, roughly uh, five. five. Uh, for every day. Drive is roughly. But sometimes the train gets delayed, like, you know, when Leaves you're trying to commute line. home. <laughs> Leaves on the line, exactly. <laughs> I should say, I, I don't know if this is appropriate or not, that you're both, you're both working on incredibly hard on it. It shows in the quality of the product and indeed in the, in the oh. popularity of the product. But there is sometimes when big beasts come over to LBC, then those medium-sized beasts that are already here. We, we, we worry a little that you might be just oh, coming... Oh, stop it. Me you might just he be co protest. You might be coming <laughs> to do a sort of lap of honour or something like that. Or we to, will to, never but, be but in you, your zoo, you the graph, huge beast. The graph that you're putting in is an example to us all. And, and, of course, it's paying dividends, which you can listen by subscribing to news agents, which you can, get, Penguin you can get from Global Club, Player. Club bar on the way out.